We um, have um, Anton Kuchuhidze, who is a representative from the opposition bloc. This party uh, was created on the base of the party of region, former party of the president Yanukovych. Now is um, one of the uh, representatives of the opposition on, in the parliament. Also, we have uh, Victoria uh, Wojcicka, who is a representative of the Samopomich, a member of the Ukrainian parliament, a new party also in the coalition, and is an expert on the energy. Uh, she came from the uh, business, from the private sector. And as well, Olga Delakova, who also came uh, from the uh, business, from the private sector, but to the previous parliament, a member of a parliament from Udar party, a party of Vitaly Klitschko, which is currently uh, in a block of the Petro Poroshenko Ukrainian president. So we wanted to start off with a general question. It was, you know, unprecedented that you have uh, pe three people of foreign origin in the new cabinet uh, that received Ukrainian citizenship via a special order from President Poroshenko, who has recently given the ability to grant that. Uh, as a foreigner myself, it may seem that I'm biased with that, uh, but I'm not. It's we're just sort of curious. You know, there was talk about that about maybe there aren't Ukrainians who can do that job. Some people were even offended that foreigners were brought in to do this. So what what are your takes on that? Maybe we. Could start with you, Victoria. Uh, well, we've um, seen the uh, opportunity of uh, offering or uh, considering foreigners to become uh, part of the uh, new uh, cabinet of ministers to be a, one of the solutions to form um, a cabinet of ministers of professionals, people mm -hmm. with a strong background, people who won't be uh, linked or connected with the political parties, people who will be dedicated to reforms and who won't, you know, look behind their shoulders and uh, be curious and worried about the ratings of their political parties. Well, so we do appreciate that the president himself has offered this opportunity to particular individuals valuing their already um, achievements that they have already uh, shown in Ukraine. Because you know Natalia Yuryesko, she worked here for over 20 years uh, with the minister. Mm -hmm. The other ministers, they also have background well, in Ukraine. It's a, a technocratic government. They're that's technocratic, they're yes, it, exactly. Uh, there was a Western headhunting firm that was supposed to identify some of the people who were qualified. And what you're saying is, you know, in the positive regard, that these are people who weren't involved in politics, you know, who, based on that, are supposed to have been chosen based on their technical We believe skills. it's, it's it's a very strong sign, and it's a positive sign for Ukraine. And it's a it's a right beginning to really make sure that the reforms, and it will be radical reforms, they do actually happen, and they happen fast and soon. Hmm. And Olga, what was your take on that? Were you an enthusiastic voter for this cabinet altogether? Well, I'd say the first day I heard about those news, I was rather skeptical. Mm -hmm. Until the point I discovered the names. Mm -hmm. And I think here it doesn't really matter that they are foreigners. What matters is that those people, they have specific experience of restructuring, changing, and crisis management. And this is what I value in them. I also value that those are very accomplished, very mature professionals which will, who will not hesitate to say no, be it to Prime Minister or be it Rada. And this is what we need right now. If it was business as usual, I'd say that's a bit strange decision. We have a lot of Ukrainians with Western background, you know, with uh, education from abroad, with experience from abroad, and we can handle our own issues just as we did on Maidan. But right now, we need very innovative solutions of people who can interpret what is happening in Ukraine, mm -hmm. get support from be it IMF, World Bank, or well, any that's other more partners. Positive take that these mm -hmm. people can present a positive face abroad. Not into only, rooms. not only, but they will they will bring different set of practices. This is my hope, and they will not hesitate to do reforms which are so much needed right now. Mm -hmm. And Anton, you are not a member of Parliament, but your uh, party they didn't vote, they stepped out, and what is your take on that? 
for us, uh, the question uh, concerning the foreigners in our, the cabinet of ministers is very controversial uh, because um, uh, we think that uh, Ukraine uh, has a lot of professionals. Uh, the second point why uh, the party was against uh, such appointments uh, because um, this position was not declared by uh, parties um, uh, uh, during the election campaign. So uh, we uh, take such action uh, as uh, um, as such, uh, which can be honest with uh, the voters. And uh, the third position is that uh, um, we had a um, great crisis manager as uh, Pablo Sharimeta in the former cabinet. And uh, I just want to remind you his uh, um, explanation of his resignation that uh, he couldn't uh, fight against the system and uh, we think that uh, this decision uh, will not lead uh, to the uh, positive changes. Well, well, one may look at uh, Pavlo Sheremeta's experience as a negative one. I still think it was a very positive sign for Ukrainian society that, uh, you know, the, the change, you know, the, the government is ready to bring the change. I wish he stayed longer. I wish he had more people like-minded on board. I wish circumstances were different. Right now, I think we need to focus on the future, and we need to do everything possible to help this government, which is a dream team. If and there is one more thing, thing to add to this. The circumstances are indeed different, because uh, when we spoke with the candidates, we asked them in particular whether they will bring team with them, because we know if we look at all sorts of ministers and um, governmental authorities, you will see that they're all people, the old system, the system itself is protected by people. And it's not just one person who is required to make a change, but uh, it, it requires like a team, warriors who will come and actually do their job. So we need to change the system from top to down. And I hope, and I do have a great hope that these people, this new cabinet of ministers will achieve that. Well, can, I, can I talk one fact? Sure, and then we'll ask for the uh, I agree with my colleagues that uh, Ukraine needs changes, and uh, the changes uh, shall start from ourselves and uh, from the um, uh, first uh, plenary session of the new Verkhovna Rada. If you look at the procedure rules of the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, Article 16, um, uh, about the obligatory list uh, which uh, uh, the Verkhovna Rada is obliged uh, to discuss uh, with uh, uh, members of parliament, you uh, will not found uh, the, uh, the issue on the um, appointment of new cabinet ministers. So if we talk about changes, uh, we must start from ourselves and we, we shall respect the rules of procedure. And uh, I can say that uh, this decision um, uh, was adopted uh, um, without uh, taking into consideration the Article 16 uh, of the Rules of Procedure of the Verkhovna Rada. Did um, your party bring this issue with uh, voting and with the procedure? The opposition bloc this time just left. Uh, not voting. Is the party starting from this moment is going to not be present in the parliament or is there any issues the party is ready to cooperate if it's good for the country? It was a sign of our protest uh, with that fact that we, uh, no, not I am, uh, but uh, the members of parliament uh, had not a chance to discuss with the uh, cabinet uh, f future ministers uh, their programs. And uh, the opposition bloc declares that uh, it is a good European practice when uh, the uh, future uh, candidates uh, uh, for ministers discuss their programs on, uh, on the committees of the Verkhovna Rada. It's a lot about timing, and actually we encourage our audience to um, be engaged for 
following our Twitter using the hashtag Hromadske, and we already get a response. So we can also, you can see that there are these tweets from the German business community, uh, and it says, German business community supportive of radical change in Ukraine, public administration, justice system, but government must act very quickly. And this uh, general concern. But what is a timetable? What is a real date? Because quick, it can be also very general. What will you demand and how you can control that? Well, I think we are all in anticipation of the major, major law of the next few weeks, which is budget law for 2015, which will set up the ground for reforms in the next year. And um, looking at the leaks in the press, uh, many people will not be happy about the uh, cuts in the social programs, in uh, state expenditures. But I'd say the, the most radical reform we need right away, both, I think we will agree, because we are working on the same committee on energy, gas and oil, the energy market, gas reform, and you know anything to do with our energy dependence on Russia and state deficit, you know, this is exactly what we need to start with. Olga brought the issue of energy, and uh, there is a lot of criticism um, in a, some way to the current Minister of Energy, um, because he was a member of this, uh, rightly say, saying, Energy Regulation and Risk uh, Commission, mm -hmm. uh, and there is a responsibility for there is a, this crisis now with the coal, with the subsidies, with energy lack, which could be maybe if it would be sorted out earlier, well, the things will get better. I think the issues like we were talking about, well, you met uh, the for not everyone who knows the foreigners, I think for, for at least for the foreign media, maybe unsurprisingly, were a very bright moment in the coalition. People with international experience who came in, who spoke English fluently. And the Minister of Energy, that was seen as a weakness. Many people in the energy sector said they didn't know who he was. And then, of course, there was the issue this week where Prime Minister Yatsenyuk had said there had been a nuclear accident, which turned out not to be a nuclear accident, but put him in a very difficult situation. Uh, what's your evaluation of him as minister? Are, are you familiar with him at all from well, your work? Well, I know him from the previous activities with the uh, investment community. But mm -hmm. I'd say, you know, energy, gas and oil industry in this country is one of the most corrupted, uh, corrupted industries. So mm -hmm. maybe it's good that nobody knows him. Maybe it's good that he's not so well connected to the elites in this uh, industry. And uh, I'd say, you know, the problem of NAFTA gas has been here for 20 years. We are talking about big numbers, you know. Uh, so anybody who was here for just two or three months, I don't think we can blame him for anything which is happening right now. We are at war. We have a real drastic situation in the east with the coal. We have, um, an, you know, energy uh, issue at the, the Parisia station, mm -hmm. which was not definitely a fault of one or two people. Mm -hmm. It's just an accident. So, uh, but I think right now the, the the good point about this government is that they are, like business people, will be able to look at the numbers and finally make this very tough decision of removing subsidies to all for no good reason. And this is something you mentioned, because uh, one of the things we try and do is explain Ukraine a bit better to our foreign audience. So when we talk about corruption in the energy sector, much of the energy is subsidized, especially for private consumers. Um, and But the issue is it's not always clear whether or not energy is going to private consumers and when it's going to a business, and then there are many subcontractors. So part of what Ukraine is trying to do is cut those subsidies, because that's uh, a monthly, you know, foreign currency amount that Ukraine puts out at a time when currency is very, very well strapped. And Victoria, are there concrete reforms you'd want to see done with Naftohaz, or what are your priorities in the energy sector? The well, the, the priorities are already indicated in the coalition agreement, mm -hmm. as we were working on it together with Olga and other representatives of the coalition. I have to admit that the initial draft of the coalition agreement was quite straightforward, and uh, uh, we we had to find certain compromises with other political parties to make sure that the wording is accepted by all five parties, by all five uh, uh, forces, as the coalition agreement is based on the consensus. So is Samopoma so, happy with the wording? Uh, the wording is weaker than it 
was initially, and we will do everything that is in our power. And I have to also come back to the comments about the Minister of Energy. Uh, we, as the uh, uh, fraction, as the party, interviewed uh, this person, and uh, during the interview, I have to admit that at least what I can say, that my judgments are based on the words that were communicated. Uh, th this person is dedicated to radical reforms that will eliminate uh, the subsidies issue, and we will touch base on that. I will try to explain that very shortly, very briefly. Uh, he wants to reform NAFTA gas. He wants to make it completely independent. He wants to break it into different specific independent parts of the business according to the EU uh, legislation law that governs the energy sector, because we now have one one big entity, like enemy, that has the production, uh, transportation, and the distribution under one umbrella. Uh, so that our foreigners and uh, people who are watching us understand, current uh, payment, the, the bill that NAFTA gas is paying for the gas is around from half a billion dollars to a billion dollars. So every month, we have to sign a check, we as a country, to finance NAFTA gas so it can go and pay for the gas that we import from Which Russia. Is a tremendous amount of money. It's, it's tremendous. We have a very strong pressure on all our foreign currency reserves. And we also have a great pressure from our international partners, from IMF in particular, mm -hmm. who are trying to convey the message that, guys, you have to stop this practice of, of cross-subsidizing the difference in in the price, $340 and above uh, the import price for the gas that we buy from Russia, and the gas that we produce here and we sell locally, which is 20 something dollars per 1,000 cubic meters. Everything that, that is on top of $23 is subsidized from the state budget. And we see the numbers of the consumption. It used to be 70 billion cubic meters, then it dropped to 50 cubic, billion cubic meters, then we dropped it to 40, and now we have, under the issue of the Cabinet of Ministers just a couple of months ago, we had to cut our consumptions to a level like 36, 37 cub, uh, billion cubic meters. But for some reason, we're not consuming much less. So if we look at the numbers, we understand that that was like we were using the norms of allocating the gas, the consuming to the consumers under the old Soviet uh, scheme, mm -hmm. which, which is completely, it's ridiculous. Like if you had two people in an apartment, you would consume X amount of uh, gas. And then if you had six people in the apartment, you would consume three times more gas. But this is not the case. Well, and it's trying to merge, you know, an old system, the way people are used to dealing with things, to the international system, and that's done. And part of what we try and do here is do a lot with explaining and explainers. So we want to draw attention to one of our explainers now, which is just on Ukraine's new government, explain, looking at the new ministers and all, all the people we have there, so you can follow at home and see our articles on Medium. Um, one, I did also want to bring attention to one tweet that we had. I'll get back to that. I believe that was uh, Hetman Andri we had. Because as we asked you, we, we sent out to our followers on Twitter how much time they gave the new government to have real concrete results to achieve. Mm -hmm. And he gave it 12 months, so a similar number to what you had uh, and suggested, which is a good one. Um, but the question, you know, my big question, maybe Natalie has a different one, is do you think the coalition can really hold together over that time and do all of that? Because as you mentioned, especially raising energy prices, that's something people aren't going to be happy about. That well, doesn't... Well, the first test will be the budget, 2015 budget, that's mm -hmm. for sure. And this is when we will see whether the task, the coalition will pass the task of unity. And I think it is, uh, it is a very special job for this government to communicate this change very efficiently, not only with MPs, but also with the people. Mm -hmm. You will be surprised, but some people are way more mature than we think about them, and they are way more readier than we expect them to be for, for these changes. I was just talking to my mom yesterday, and she said to me, you know what, I do understand that in a country which is facing 
actual world we have to save. And I do understand that maybe I will not be able to travel by, car, by, uh, by public transportation so often as I was traveling before. But the problem here is not only energy sector. We do have to, you know, make an order in all those social programs, in our public expenditures for education, for medicine. You know, we, we make it, uh, we need to make it personalized, not just, you know, a black hole on our budget. Yeah, um, okay. Well, uh, maybe, and also Anson will jump into that, but I have a bit different question. We, while like traveling and being in the East, in the area which is under the separatist control, mm -hmm. you see a horrible situation, which is a humanitarian, close to humanitarian disaster when many people for ye for months hasn't received any pension and it's already an issue that they can buy basic things. And the issue with the IDPs, it's still a lot of money. So how are you gonna, you know, like at the same time say that it's very important for the country to cut, but at the same time a huge amount of millions of the people in this country are really on the edge and need support from the government because they don't have any other. Yeah, well, the, the keeping the balance between uh, supporting those who need it and removing all the perks and privileges from those who are way beyond living standards, you know, they have enough of, uh, that's why government right now is talking about special pensions, and this is one of the IMF requests, uh, special perks, including to MPs and to judges and to prosecutors and to other, you know, levels of, uh, high level officials, you know, but, but I totally agree with you that those who are uh, under very difficult circumstances, they have to get uh, pensions, they have to get uh, support from in terms of medical support, they have to get everything which uh, will keep them uh, surviving through this hard time. So we have a question we want to ask each of you and we'll start with Anton. Mm -hmm. What would you, what are the top three reforms that you would want to see uh, from this government or what do you think the top three reforms are that Ukraine needs at this point in time? Uh, I think that reform is um, a long-standing process and uh, uh, it is a very difficult process. Uh, my colleagues uh, talk a lot uh, about um, uh, the reform of energy sector, yeah? Uh, but I just uh, want to remind uh, one of the uh, message from the IMF, uh, uh, which uh, um, we can find in the memorandum between the government of Ukraine and uh, internationally monetary fund, fund that uh, our government is obliged uh, to create program uh, for support so-called low-income uh, people. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it it means uh, mm, the appropriate energy. Uh, uh, the appropriate energy program for them. Uh, we uh, didn't see it from the Mr. Yatsenyuk, so um, uh, I just want to say that uh, um, we don't need to talk a lot about future, but let's talk about such uh, ab obligations uh, which our government uh, have. Um, and uh, uh, if you are interested in my mind um, uh, about uh, the reforms, I think if our, co if our colleagues um, uh, take uh, the experience of Georgia, yeah, uh, you can find one uh, interesting fact that uh, Mr. Saakashvili started uh, his reform from the judiciary system. If we look um, uh, our uh, foreigners in current uh, cabinet of ministers, yeah, it is the position of uh, Ministry of Economy, mm -hmm. it is the position of Ministry of Finance, uh, and uh, so you're saying the judiciary needs to be more yes. focused. So, yes. So um, having this time, also, what is your, what are your priorities? If to just name them, being very concrete. Once again, energy reform, which means restructuring naft uh, naftagas, uh, you know, situation and. Uh, 
introducing market prices for uh, people along with a clear and very specific system of subsidies for the poor and those who need uh, support from the state. Uh, also, uh, we, right now, uh, our banking and financial system, you know, financial institutions are not in a very healthy position. Uh, just uh, in the fall, we did stress test uh, and BU run stress test with the 15 major banks and only five of them were up to the levels. So uh, the government and NBU will be facing very, uh, um, very difficult dilemma or whether to spend remains of the reserves or whether to uh, let some of the banks leave the market. Uh, and uh, finally, we actually need to set up the ground for business to regain the trust with the government. I, will, I expect this budget to be a uh, budget law to be very tough, but I do hope that the government will not only increase taxes on business and uh, people and uh, cover the what deficit by increasing the taxes. Encouraging the climate. And Victoria, what would your top One, two, three. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> if we uh, can get this. <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> well, energy reform was mentioned. Uh, judicial reform, we need to bring back the trust in our judicial system and it the, it relates to both people here who live in Ukraine, but also it relates to the foreigners and the investors that do want to come to the country where their interests, their investments will be protected. Uh, and illustration together with the fight with the corruption, mm -hmm. uh, that's also one of major concerns of ours, the uh, top priorities. And the, the third one is the decentralization. We want to bring the power, the budgets closer to communities and together with the responsibilities for managing those. A lot of ambition, new government, new parliament, but the same old practice of fighting in the parliament. That's what an international audience also mm. uh, have seen this week. And as a member of the new parliament at the revolution of dignity, how do you feel about that? What are you going to do? Is it all the same practice when people are like fighting? Is well, a parliament a place for that? I, I'd Definitely say I not. regret seeing it. I do hope that that was just a, you know, kind of a um, emotional start of the parliament. That uh, that uh, last week was very long week because we basically spent it waiting and waiting, discussing, consulting, and uh, not voting. So I, I only hope that uh, starting from next week we will be very serious about considering drafts. Uh, of the laws, discussing ideas of how to get our country out of crisis and less fighting. I mean, it seems, it's interesting because the, the fights have been there for a while. There have been articles written, especially in foreign media, for a long time. It's dynamic, it's on television. This is slightly different because it was Parasuk, who's from Maidan, who's always been very impassioned, and he was concerned that the values of Maidan weren't being respected. Um, but I guess one of the points that I'm curious about is how, how can these sort of conflicts be Resolved because in that particular incident, you know, it was Parisuk who theoretically is pro-Europe, pro all these reforms, but came to heads with Groisman, you know, the speaker. Um, how he didn't. Do you he didn't get into heads with Groisman. He had his personal position, uh, and it related to the way uh, the uh, process of um, voting for the distributions of committees was done. Mm -hmm. But he was provoked. He was provoked by one of his colleagues from Blok Poroshenko. And I think in order to avoid such situations, all we need to do is to be don't patient. Provoke, don't provoke don't, pro don't provoke each other. I mean, we have to be respectful to each other. And we have to be really careful about the things that we're seeing in the parliament. Because we are we were being considered. Like, people looking at us as a, at the mirror, and they're basically, especially in the outside world, we've been perceived by the picture they see when they look at the parliament. So we but have to be very careful when we... And how do you do that? Because you must have some, some experience with that as well. You're a member of the party Volia, correct? Which correct. split after it came into the parliament and yes. that was a big issue of controversy because it was the first you know, new party that arrived and fresh faces, all of that. Um, and then it split and that was frustrating. And for it was people. very peaceful. Mm. I hope you follow the news. It was completely there are no fights that I heard. No fights. They're peaceful. We've admitted that unfortunately we've lost control over the party, and mm -hmm. this is what happened. We couldn't uh, stay with people who unfortunately uh, took a control not in the nice way, so to say. And 
I think it comes from the inner uh, soul and it comes from the respect that comes from within people. And we, if we do respect ourselves, we have to, we will respect our colleagues as well. But can you have those conflicts and still work with people in parliament? I mean, that, we that's have to like... work. We have to work. That's the only way we actually can move on and uh, implement reforms and really bring our country to a completely different The show, our show is interactive, so the Twitter user at Raxaro uh, asks, how are you going to recruit professionals who will need to replace current corrupt bureaucrats to achieve any reform progress? Well, it's uh, it's a question. It's a very good question, and there are already uh, indicated and communicated ways how to do that. First of all, we're planning, and we hope to see it in the budget that we will be presented, considerable cuts in the number of state employees, which means that we will have uh, freed amount of funds that we can use to f for a smaller number of people and we will be able then to attract professionals by actually implementing the process of open um, uh, selections like it's done in the private sector. You have a job opening, uh, you have a screening, you have a period for application and etc. So it can be done and uh, uh, there is an issue with finances, and the, the, this issue is then solved by cutting the number of people. Um, the last but pretty controversial topic, the topic of this week, is this creation of the Ministry uh -huh. of Information, uh -huh. which is already called the Ministry of the Truth, Truth, the Ministry of Propaganda. You voted for this cabinet. Uh, you, you didn't have, have you voted? I withdrew from You withdrew from yes. Have you voted? Well, I just didn't vote by occasion because I was um, kind of misled by the situation in the uh, room. Uh, and uh, I was not happy about the procedure of uh, voting for this particular ministry. However, I am about to, uh, to publish tomorrow my, my new blog post on what is my vision for what this ministry is supposed to do? So uh, the, um, the, there is a, um, one of our users, Serhi, SK says, truth ministry is good in the time of war if it can create efficient count propaganda, international TV channels similar to RT. This is very different to what the media community here says, and there were protests. We'll see that later, but that is really considered. Uh, with the whole, we will have a discussion right after on that with the media lawyers, why it contradicts a lot of principles uh, of this country. Um, so what you, what is your take on that? So are you in favor? Uh, I'm not in favor of Ministry of Propaganda and Ministry of Truth because I actually think people are smart enough to uh, make their own judgment of uh, whether some facts are true or not. But I do miss right now, once again, I'm, uh, I was studying how reforms were done in the other countries. And in many cases, 90% of the reforms which were not successful, those reforms were not communicated in a proper way to the people in the, in, the, in the country. So I do not believe that Ministry of Information and Truth should be targeting uh, people who don't believe uh, us, who d don't want to hear what we have to offer. But I do believe that Ukrainians, regular Ukrainians, are hungry right now to know what is going to happen in their future. So if I may, I would advise this minister to be focused on uh, delivering messages from the current government of which, on which reforms and how exactly will be done uh, in the next uh, months. Generally, you consider that the press secretaries and the press officers of the, of the particular minister can do that job or any coordination. And the issue was also to explain with the uh, way this minister was introduced a a lot of people didn't know about that even a couple of days before. It's a new minister in a budget. So Victoria We've learned about it a couple of hours before the voting. So it wasn't even worse, not just a couple of days. It was like a night before the voting. I withdrew from the voting and actually I had because handled, of that? Because of that uh, issue not just or? because of that, not because of the procedural issue. I uh, also truly believe that we don't need this ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe that uh, we need to, uh, if there is an issue, we need to split it and analyze it. What is the issue? Is the issue that we lack the communication with the outside world? Mm -hmm. Okay, there is one particular function of 
of our ambassadors and our missions abroad that they have to communicate what is happening in Ukraine and they have to work really with the international communities. If they cannot do that, let's let them replace them with people who can do that. Our Hanna Hapko, member of our um, party, she uh, ha has been uh, elected as the head of the uh, Committee on Foreign um, Relations and her mission, as she sees it, is to present Ukraine internationally in the way that has to explain what is really happening, what is planning, what are the plans of the cabinet of ministers, of, of the government, all, all the political uh, parties. So we have very strong foundation for international uh, communication with the international world, which is our embassies and our uh, missions. But there are other chairs. Yes. There are other chairs. You are, well, we need to make sure that they then are not silent. If we look at here locally, then again, what is the question? What is the issue? Do we need access to TV channels? Or do we want to create additional one? Or we want to use, as you said, the press uh, at the show? We the asked ministers. to the people that uh, the there was a question, is creating Minister of Truth dangerous for Ukraine democracy in a time of war? So the answer from um, the was that literally the worst, democracy and participation, the only thing that can save the country, otherwise just promises uh, not reforms. Uh, that was made by the um, Liberta user. And Anton, we're wrapping up. And, uh, can, can I so add what some words? According to the words of uh, our political opponents, uh, we see that uh, they have not uh, uh, final um, explanation of this ministry. And I uh, want uh, to, to pay your attention on that fact that uh, the coalition um, refused from the creating uh, the real uh, problem committee as a committee uh, on, uh, on the questions of Crimea and uh, Donbass. And uh, this uh, committee uh, will not have uh, such unclear explanation. It is a real problem for Ukraine, but uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, give a post for minister to the ministry, uh, which is not uh, uh, in fact, uh, it is, uh, um, I think, uh, uh, unclear for everybody in Ukraine. Your party in the previous uh, parliament was the one which, you know, voted for the laws uh, which used to be called, uh, are called the dictatorship law, mm -hmm. and a lot on the laws which suppress the press freedom. On this case, I mean, we can expect the Minister on Truth under Yanukovych very well. So, do you think, so, beside the reason there can be a different committee, what do you think about the Ministry of the Communication, as it is the, mm -hmm. the proper name of it? I can answer uh, that uh, um, who, who voted uh, on these uh, uh, laws, laws of uh, the 16th of January, uh, they regretted and uh, they uh, said about uh, their mistake and uh, uh, the members of uh, parliament wish our colleagues uh, will not um, make such mistake again. It was a technical mistake of many, so uh, we only wish to our colleagues. So we'll follow uh, more on that. Thanks a lot for participation. We Thank had you. representatives from the, uh, the members of parliament from the Poroshenko bloc, from Samopomich party, and uh, a representative of opposition bloc.